All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Legion of School. Uh, so today, uh, we're gonna be talking some more uh, about how tasks are actually executed. Uh, so the last, uh, the last session, what we did, or the last high-level session, uh, we looked at uh, how individual tasks uh, executed uh, and specifically how they uh, go through their, their uh, through the task pipeline and, and all the different stages that they, they incorporate. Uh, today, what I wanna do is actually talk uh, through one last piece of the individual tasks, the aspect of the individual tasks execution, um, and then we're going to get into the uh, index-based task launches to see how they actually execute. Okay, so to remind everybody where we were, uh, I'm going to go back uh, into Legion Tasks uh, .cc, which is where we have all of our code uh, for uh, for our task uh, objects. You recall that there's a, a base task op. Uh, and then we inherit from all of that for all of our different task kinds. Uh, and specifically, the last time we were looking at single task uh, trigger execution, uh, uh, which is what was um, which provides you know the base execution model for both individual tasks and point tasks. So the single task class uh, is you know the the uh, abstract base class for both individual tasks and point tasks, and it's the one that provides all the context and information for executing. Uh, actual tasks on real processors. Uh, so you recall the last time what we did uh, during our session was we actually went through this uh, trigger execution uh, method for single tasks in a great uh, level of detail. And we saw about all the different stages of how tasks uh, execute, uh, start off executing locally by processing through this uh, this bottom part of the uh, this bottom part of the the function first. Uh, and then if they get sent remotely uh, by the mapper, uh, you know, we have a separate path up here at the top that handles the remote case, uh, where we actually get sent uh, to remote nodes, and we have to possibly map and, and then execute ourselves uh, remotely. And the important takeaway, I think, from from this function was that you know we've abstracted away a lot of the details of the various stages here. So we have methods for launch task and perform mapping, and you know, uh, checking to see if we pre-mapped and doing the pre-mapping and so forth. And you can really see the structure of of how these tasks are are. Uh, are executed for, for individual tasks. So uh, the last time what we did, I think when we ended the, the session, uh, we had just finished uh, doing uh, the launch task uh, method, uh, which actually, you know, had actually launched tasks onto our low-level processors uh, to actually have them run. And so today what I want to do is actually show you a little bit about what happens when those tasks uh, actually do run. Uh, and then we'll see a little bit about how uh, how individual tasks finish, and then we we should still have some time left, and I'll hopefully be able to get into uh, doing index-based task launches. Do you recall the last thing that we looked at uh, at the end of the session the last time was uh, was launch task, and this is a big complicated method that sets up all of the state for actually executing a task on a processor, and then way down here at the bottom, uh, I can scroll all the way down here. Um, there's an actual task launch call uh, onto the low-level processor right here. Uh, we actually launch our task onto our low-level processor, at which point it's off and running. Uh, or it's it's free to run whenever the low-level runtime determines it should run, based on you know the start condition uh, low-level runtime event that we've given uh, for actually running the for actually running the task. Okay, so today let's uh, let's begin by actually looking at what happens when that task uh, starts running. In order to do this, um, one of the things we need to look at is actually uh, we need to look a little bit at how uh, our tasks are actually registered. Because what we're going to see is that high-level runtime actually places a wrapper around application-level tasks uh, that sort of intercepts uh, the state or intercepts the task execution when it starts running on the low-level runtime and does a little bit of startup uh, and then cleanup work um, before uh, the task actually goes into the application part of the. Uh, the, the task that, that the application has requested. Uh, so let's actually step back and look at uh, where this registration uh, takes place and actually look at some of the wrappers uh, that we have around uh, the tasks that we that you register with the, uh, the high-level runtime. So just to refresh your memory about where all this stuff uh, comes on, I talk about you know registering tasks. Uh, so there's a method in the, uh, I'm back in legion.h here, which is the, uh, the legion header file. And there's a method here. Uh, there's actually a whole overloaded set of methods with the same name uh, called register legion task. And you recall that you know before you start up your application, you actually have to register a whole bunch of 
you have to register all your application tasks uh, with the Legion runtime. We're currently in the process of making it so you can dynamically register tasks, but right now it's pretty much all a static uh, operation. In the future, we'll be able to allow you to dynamically register uh, these different task implementations. But you recall that when you call this register Legion task uh, before you actually start the runtime today, what you do is you template this based on a function pointer uh, that has a certain signature. And specifically, you know, we can have any arbitrary return type here, we have our function pointer, uh, it takes a task, and then our function pointer has to have this signature. It takes a, a const task star, a vector of physical regions, a context, and a high-level runtime as, as arguments. Uh, so we, we pass in you know, some function pointer that's going to represent our application-level task. It has to have this signature. And then we give ourselves all sorts of different, uh, different uh, parameters about what you know, the properties of this task are, what task ID it is, what kind of processor it can run on, can it do uh, individual tasks or index-based task launches, what does, do you want to pick a variant ID and, and so forth? And we have a couple of versions of this register legion task for handling you know, void return types and uh, more complex uh, uh, or, or registering user data with these tasks and so forth, but they're all pretty much going to go to the same place. Um, and so what you're going to notice is that uh, inside of this call here, I'm actually, uh, we're actually looking just very briefly inside of this call. What you see is that we're actually going to wrap up uh, we're going to create a new uh, uh, functional pointer here. And what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up our task pointer. This is the original uh, task pointer that our application has passed in as, as the function pointer for its uh, uh, function to call. And we're going to wrap this up in a little wrapper uh, function, uh, which is going to handle uh, doing those sort of the startup and shutdown or, or startup and teardown for various uh, application level tasks. So you see that we have this separate uh, Legion task uh, wrapper namespace here, uh, and then we have a way of naming the different kinds of wrappers. And we pass in, you know, the return type and the the task uh, or the function pointer the application gave us to actually generate these wrappers. Uh, so let's actually go look at what one of these wrappers uh, uh, looks like. Notice I'm still in uh, Legion.h here because this is all templated stuff, so we want to make sure all this expands correctly. So it's all in the header file. If I search for Legion task wrapper, uh, we'll get a whole bunch of these here's the uh, the class with the declaration. Uh, so you see that there's just a class called Legion Task Wrapper, and we're going to have a whole bunch of uh, static methods in here that represent uh, that are going to have the different wrappers for various kinds of tasks. So we have non-void return types. Uh, we have void return types uh, uh, for various you know incarnations of different uh, versions. These are some of the older. Uh, these ones down here are actually older ones, uh, older versions of of the wrappers. Uh, the newer ones here are these ones that say, you know, Legion task or Legion UDT task wrapper. Uh, so, okay, uh, let's actually go find the implementation of this. Okay, here is our implementation of this, this task wrapper. It's pretty short, um, but there is some, you know, tricky uh, templating uh, stuff going on here. Okay, so we get is we get our uh, return, this template is templated on our return site. And then the function pointer that the application has asked us to uh, has given us to actually name the application level task that we want to run. And you see that what we do is we're actually converting uh, from the low level task uh, type signature to our high level task type signature. So notice that this Legion task wrapper has a signature uh, for a low level runtime task. So if I'm I'm not sure if Sean has actually shown this in the low level runtime interface yet. Uh, but our low-level processor tasks have to have the signature of taking three arguments, a const void star, which is going to point to some arguments, a size t, which describes the argument length, and then a processor p, which describes the processor that the task is running on. So all low-level runtime tasks have to take this signature, uh, or have to have this signature. And so what this wrapper is doing is providing you know, a mediating uh, me mechanism from converting from this low-level runtime uh, task signature to our high-level uh, uh, task signature, which involves things like task pointers and, and physical regions and our context and our runtime and so forth. And so what we're going to do uh, is we're actually going to, when our tasks actually start running on the little runtime, what we're going to end up doing is first having to set up all of our arguments and then calling our, and then calling the application level uh, task function pointer uh, that we've been given. So what you're going to see here is uh, we've got a, this, this wrapper is really pretty simple. Um, the first thing it does, we've got a couple of static asserts in here. These are static compile time asserts. Uh, they impact, they won't impact your code at all. 
uh, we're effectively just checking that you aren't returning certain kinds of, of values, like you can't return futures and future maps uh, as the value of this template uh, T here and so forth. Uh, and we're also checking that you haven't exceeded the size of the maximum return size and, and everything like that. Um, but these are all really just static asserts. They're not going to impact your code, code at all. Um, so the first thing we do that's actual real code here uh, is we're going to pull out we want to get access to the actual runtime object uh, for this processor uh, that we're running on. So of course our high-level runtime uh, has a static method called get runtime based on our processor. Um, and I'm not going to show you this today, but effectively it's just looking up into a, as part of the startup, one of the things that we did was we stored a pointer to the high-level runtime for every one of our processors. And we have a big uh, static table uh, as part of this high-level runtime class. Uh, and so we can actually go and get uh, a pointer to our high-level runtime instance uh, for this particular low-level processor. So we can actually, this is how we're going to bootstrap ourselves. So first we get a pointer to our runtime. Uh, the next thing we're going to get uh, is we're going to know that when we kicked off our low-level uh, task, what we did was we wrapped up a pointer to our context. Remember a context is a type def uh, for a single task uh, a pointer. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to pull our context out of the arguments that we got passed in, in here as part of our args. Just to show you where this is coming from, let me actually just uh, jump back here to legionx.cc uh, so you can see that we passed in a, ourselves as the, as the single task star uh, argument. So if we look at uh, launch task, scroll all the way down here to where our task launch is. Okay, here's our task launch. And you'll notice that the thing that we're passing in uh, is uh, we're actually passing in a pointer uh, to ourself. Uh, because of C++, it doesn't allow you to, you know, take the address of, of this and keep it const uh, or in, in a non-const way. Uh, so we make a little copy of ourselves uh, of the pointer, but we're just passing in our pointer as an argument. Uh, so we're taking the address of this and size of, of our pointer. And that's the argument to our low-level uh, runtime task that we're kicking off. And so when we come back here into our task wrapper, uh, jumping back to, to legion.h, uh, and are searching for uh, legion task wrapper. Uh, so when we come down here into our low runtime, or into this task wrapper, when we get invoked by the low runtime to actually run this task, we know that this args uh, is always going to be a pointer to a is always going to be a, a context pointer or a single task pointer. What we're doing is we're unpacking uh, that single task pointer. Remember, a context is a type def for a single task uh, pointer. Uh, so we get our context uh, out of the arguments that we passed in uh, to the low runtime. Effectively, it's just handing it back to us. And then once we've got that, what we can do is we can actually call uh, to a method here to actually say uh, begin our task. Um, uh, to make sure to get our arguments based on uh, you know the set of regions uh, that we're that we've mapped as part of our as part of our mapping. Uh, so this is how we get a reference to our our set of physical regions that we've mapped uh, for this particular task. Uh, we call this begin task call. I'm not going to get into it today, but begin task is really pretty simple. It you know starts up some profiling information if you've asked for it, uh, and then just returns these regions. It doesn't really do very much. Uh, it's a very simple method call. Um, so, but this begin task will give us back a, a reference to our vector of physical regions that were mapped. And then what we can do is we can actually invoke um, our, uh, our uh, uh, the application level task uh, that, that we've been given as a function pointer here uh, from, from the template arguments. And so we store our return value uh, as the result of invoking our task. Uh, we do a little reinterpret cast here on this task uh, star pointer because uh, it actually doesn't know uh, in legion.h that a uh, context star is the same as a is is you know inheriting from from task star so we have to have a little reinterpret cast here uh, but it's it's always guaranteed to be true uh, so there's no re reason to worry about that we pass in our regions uh, we pass in our context and we pass in our runtime and our application tasks then have access to all of those different things to match up with this type signature that we've required all our application tasks uh, to abide by. Okay, um, and then the last thing that we do uh, inside this task wrapper is after we've gotten our return value back, uh, what we want to do is actually end our task and mark that, uh, and, and possibly uh, serialize this value that's been returned to us. Uh, so applications can actually return uh, complex types. Um, 
And so one of the things that we do is we have a little bit of template metaprogramming in here in this Legion serialization class, which knows how to uh, to pack up uh, these uh, these uh, more complex um, types if the user has defined the right uh, set of arguments. Uh, but ultimately, what it's going to end up doing is calling a method very similar to this one, saying runtime arrow end task uh, with our context, and then a point, and then our future return, and then a buffer with our packed uh, future return value. Uh, actually, I can just show you. Uh, what the signature is for for end task. Uh, if I search for begin task, uh, there's a bunch of begin task calls in here, um, but somewhere up here at the top of our runtime, uh, once we get down, here we go. Uh, you can see that you know uh, our runtime supports a begin task and an end task method. These are one of the few private methods that we show on the high level uh, runtime that we have to expose through, so we can have these wrappers in the header file. Um, but you can see, you know, the begin task has we pass in our context and we get back our our reference to our vector of physical regions. And you see the end task call will just end up passing in the context, uh, a pointer to a buffer containing the result of the task uh, size, and then a little boolean saying whether or not uh, the memory uh, the runtime should take ownership uh, of the uh, this buffer that's getting passed in. Uh, so it's really really very simple. Um, uh, so this wrapper is is really uh, pretty pretty simple. Uh, we're really just uh, starting up, grabbing the arguments for the task, calling the application level task, and then packing everything up and, and telling the task that we're done. Uh, we're actually going to go look at end task uh, in a little more detail here in just a minute, but let me actually just show you there's a couple different variations of this wrapper. Uh, so this was the one for, for typed, which actually has return types. Uh, there are also versions, uh, because C++ is a little bit weird, uh, you can't actually instantiate a template uh, uh, type name with uh, T with a void uh, type, so we have to have a separate wrapper here for void return types. Uh, so this this function is really doing the exact same thing, except at the end here it can just call end task directly without needing to do all the fancy uh, template metaprogramming. Um, and then we have also have these UDT wrappers, uh, which effectively allow us to unpack uh, some user data types or user data that the application has registered as part of this task's uh, execution. Uh, and really, you know, we're just unpacking a little bit of extra information uh, from uh, the actual task implementation and passing it through to the task. Uh, but everything else is pretty much identical to the other kinds of, of task wrappers. And then we have a void return type uh, uh, for UDT uh, as well. And most of these other wrappers that you'll see in here, are these, these other high-level wrappers, are really just deprecated code from earlier versions of the Legion runtime uh, when we had other signatures for, for tasks. Uh, and so we've mostly gotten rid of those now, and we mainly just use these uh, these Legion task wrapper uh, wrappers that we've been looking at here. Okay, does anyone have any questions about these wrappers before I go on and actually look at the uh, the calls to begin and end task uh, and dig into those in a little more detail? Okay, cool. Uh, let me actually go. Uh, let's actually go take a look at these begin and end task. Uh, method calls, so we can actually see uh, what actually and where they end up going and, and what they end up doing. Okay, uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is actually jump, just show you the the, the translation here, uh, or just to show you where these these calls end up going, uh, the begin and end task uh, methods. Uh, so if we search for uh, begin task uh, in here. You see that uh, the runtime is actually just turning around and calling begin and end task. Uh, on the particular context uh, that we've been invoked. So this is begin task uh, right here. And this is end task right here. We're just turning around and calling uh, the same methods on the actual task context uh, that we have. So let's actually go look at where those come out uh, in Legion tasks uh, .cc. Okay, searching for uh, begin task. Okay, and you'll notice that all these methods are on single tasks. So they're the same for both individual tasks and point tasks, uh, regardless of, of what's going on. Okay, uh, so what we do, uh, we've got a little, uh, uh, we've got a bunch of assertions here to check all sorts of invariants uh, that we do when we're doing debugging uh, to make sure that every, the task got set up correctly when it was being launched. Uh, one of the first things that we do uh, is we actually record our executing processor, the processor that we're currently on. Uh, you might think that you know exactly which processor uh, we launched the task onto, and that was that used to be true. Uh, but now we actually have this capability for our mappers to say to place tasks onto groups of processors, actually requesting that a task can run on any one of a set of processors. Uh, and so one of the first things we do is we actually figure out 
uh, which processor we're actually on. Uh, and we record that on our executing processor field, which is one of the fields, uh, I believe, on the task, uh, or on the task star object, which mappers can actually see. Uh, you'll notice there's a whole bunch of logging calls uh, for all of our different logging systems, but they're not really doing much of anything. Uh, and then one of the things that we do uh, is we'll start up some profiling information. If the mapper asked us to actually record, uh, you know, information about the time uh, that the task is going to are asked for profiling information about this task. Uh, in the future, this will become more, uh, this is sort of a placeholder right now for more sophisticated mapping or profiling infrastructure, but uh, it's really, you know, just the beginning. So we're just putting this in here to show where it's going to go. Uh, one of the things that we do do uh, is we actually call this method uh, here uh, called decrement pending on our parent task context. And you'll recall that when we talked about the, uh, the scheduler uh, for our mapper, uh, uh, for our for we, we actually talked about how our mappers go about scheduling tasks. One of the things that I mentioned was that uh, the mappers have a way, or our processor managers actually have a way of tracking how many contexts are far enough, have mapped far enough ahead. Uh, and what this call is effectively doing is mark telling our parent task context that it now has one more uh, outstanding child task which has started running. Uh, and so that task can no longer be considered, you know, mapped. Uh, and and not running yet, uh, and this sort of gives a hint to the or gives the uh, the parent context the ability to activate itself so that the processor manager can start invoking the mapper again for this uh, parent task if if there aren't enough outstanding uh, map tasks uh, if we haven't effectively run far enough ahead uh, into the future. Uh, so I'm not going to show you where this goes today, uh, but effectively you can think of this decrement pending as saying we know we used to the parent context is tracking how many outstanding tasks have been mapped. But haven't started running yet, and once we have enough of those, we can tell our mapper we're done. We're going to stop mapping for a little while, uh, and so by once we start running, we actually decrement this count uh, to actually mark that uh, we no longer have this. Ta this task can no longer be considered mapped and outstanding. Uh, it's actually starting, and so it might be a good idea to actually start uh, invoking the mapper again uh, and uh, and start mapping ahead again into the future. Uh, so that's really all that this call is doing. Uh, and, and I'm not going to get into it today, but it is an important call because it sort of manages the scheduling. Okay, and then we're done. We just return a reference to our physical regions that were mapped uh, as part of our execution. So that's the begin task call. It's really very simple. Um, and so right next to it here, uh, right below it here, is the end task call. So what happens when we're actually done uh, with, our act with our application level task? Uh, how do we go about uh, shutting ourselves down? Okay, well, first thing we do, uh, if we ask for to do any profiling, uh, what we do is we record our stop time, uh, and then we can invoke a mapper call to actually tell the mapper uh, about uh, the completion of this task and say, you know, we've we finished our execution, you asked for profiling information, so here's the profiling information. Um, the next thing that we do uh, is we actually uh, have to go through and clean up some data uh, associated with this task's actual execution. Uh, so first thing we do is we unmap all of the physical regions if they haven't been unmapped already by the application. Uh, so all of our physical regions that we had, we can unmap them. Uh, and we can also unmap uh, any you know, inline mapped uh, regions that our, that our task uh, generated as part of its execution. Uh, so we can unmap those as well if they haven't been done so already. Uh, one important detail, uh, or this next part of the code, uh, is actually handling a very interesting case uh, you know, that, that some people don't always think about. Uh, which is, and you see we have a special case here for whether or not we're a leaf task or if, if we're a leaf task, we can skip this uh, or if we had, uh, or if, you know, we had virtual mappings, we're actually going to skip this for now. Um, but one of the things we're actually going to do is if our tasks actually asked uh, for, for write privileges on any of our regions, uh, it's possible that we actually launched subtasks, uh, which generated um, data physical instances that were not the physical instances that we initially mapped. Uh, under these circumstances, uh, one of the things that we have to do is we actually have to issue uh, operations to move the data back to the physical instances that the parent task at, that this parent task that's finishing actually mapped. Uh, the reason for that is, you know, some consumer of the regions uh, that depends on the parent task is assuming that the data is going to be in those physical instances when they mapped. Uh, so we actually have to close the loop and, allow, and copy back the data from uh, where any of our child tasks uh, from this task 
actually left data sitting in physical instances and actually move them back to the physical instance uh, which we originally mapped. So to do that, the runtime has a special operation called a close operation, uh, which actually knows how to close up uh, all of the region trees for this, uh, this uh, parent task that's finishing uh, into the physical instances that it originally mapped. So you can see what we're doing here is we're looping over all of our regions. Uh, we're checking to see uh, if there are any virtual mapped region, we're skipping any virtual mapped regions or any regions where we only had read only or no access. Uh, effectively, read only uh, cases, we know that uh, that we didn't modify the data, so we don't need to do these close operations. But for anything that we did, uh, where we had privileges that required us to do a close, we actually, or actually to write some data, we actually have to do this close. So what we're gonna do is let's make this special kind of operation called a close op, which is gonna close up the physical the, the, the physical region tree up to a single physical instance that the parent task uh, actually mapped. What we do is we ask the runtime to allocate ourselves one of these close ops. Uh, we initialize it with information about which region we're closing and the physical instance uh, that we're supposed to be targeting, the one that was originally mapped uh, for this parent task. And then what we do is we just push this close op right into the dependence queue, uh, just as if the application had requested it uh, automatically. Uh, and it goes through dependence analysis and does all the normal things uh, that our tasks, uh, that our operations would normally do uh, going through the pipeline. Uh, we'll see that these close ops actually uh, are get created in another place as well, but this is the first place that you're going to see them. Uh, the close ops are one of the few kinds of operations that we support which are not uh, directly visible inside of the, uh, the Legion uh, API, but uh, they're important because they provide this, you know, important functionality of being able to perform these close operations. Uh, and the runtime figures out when it's when it's necessary to generate these uh, these close ops. Uh, okay, so after we've uh, generated these uh, close ops uh, for this uh, this this task, uh, one of the things that we do is we actually want to figure out uh, when all of our children have been our the child operations that we've launched as part of this parent tasks execution. Uh, can actually be considered mapped. Um, this is an important detail of the Legion runtime, which is that we actually don't allow um, a parent task to be a parent task that's launching off child tasks right now to consider itself mapped uh, until all of its child operations that is launched uh, as part of its execution can also be considered mapped. And you'll notice that that's a recursive definition. So what that means is that you know all those child tasks have to be or child operations have to be mapped, and therefore all of their children have to be mapped, and so forth. Uh, uh, as well. And the reason for this is that we found that if we didn't abide by this uh, this principle, you could get into nasty uh, resource deadlock uh, cases um, where effectively what you had done is mapped too far ahead in one branch of the task tree. Uh, and as a result, you consumed resources which are actually going to depend on tasks which hadn't mapped yet. And if you mapped up and used up all the memory in your system, uh, and then those other tasks couldn't map, uh, they couldn't run to satisfy the dependencies. Uh, and so this is effectively a way of avoiding resource deadlock uh, inside of these machines. If we had memories with infinite you know, memory and we could always guarantee that our tasks were going to be able to map successfully, we wouldn't need to enforce uh, this criteria. But we know that resources are finite, uh, so we enforce this invariant that parent tasks can only consider themselves mapped once all of their child operations uh, have also considered themselves mapped. What we want to do, uh, what we do is we actually keep a low-level runtime event uh, that we use to track uh, when all our operations have mapped. Uh, we'll see where this gets used uh, a little bit later. Uh, but effectively, this, is, this, is, this, this all children mapped event uh, is a user level, low level runtime event uh, that will trigger once we know that all of our child operations have mapped. And so what we're doing right here in this little block of code is actually chaining all of these dependencies uh, for our children being mapped uh, onto this, uh, this event right here. What we do is we go through all of our operations that are still executing. Uh, so we have two, we keep track of all of our ch outstanding child operations as part of execution. I haven't showed you how this actually happens uh, yet, but we actually have lists of all the children that we have outstanding, which are either executing or have already executed. Uh, and we also have one for complete. Uh, but in this case, complete, we know we are already done. So what we do is we iterate over all of the outstanding child operations that we have for this task. Uh, we get their event corresponding to when their children have mapped. Uh, and we're adding this to a set of low-level events uh, that describe uh, the various preconditions uh, for, for, being, for all our children being mapped. We do this for both sets. Uh, and then what we do is we trigger our low-level, our all-children mapped event 
uh, contingent upon the merge of all of these preconditions for all of our children uh, being, uh, being met. Uh, and so that's how we chain together uh, these dependencies. Uh, at a little bit later point in time, we'll actually see where this all children mapped uh, event actually gets, uh, gets used. Okay, after we've done that, uh, we can clear out some information about uh, the physical regions that we were tracking and so forth. Uh, there's some Legion, uh, so some login calls here. Uh, here's an important uh, function that actually takes place. You'll recall that this end task method uh, took in a pointer to a buffer uh, and a size and a, an indication of whether or not we actually own this buffer. This is the result of the task. So this buffer is storing, uh, it's an untyped buffer storing the result uh, of the task that we just, just executed. Uh, and so one of the things we need to do is we actually need to handle this, uh, this, this future. Uh, and handle future actually is a virtual method uh, that ends up doing different things depending on if you are an, individual's, an individual task launch or whether you are a point task launch as part of, as part of uh, uh, an, uh, an index-based task launch. So if we actually search for handle future. Okay, uh, it's a pretty simple method for individual tasks. Uh, if we're remote, we're going to actually try and store this uh, value in a buffer so that we can actually uh, so we can pass it back. We don't, actually don't put it into the future yet. Uh, but if we're not remote, we can actually go ahead and put it directly into the uh, the future result uh, for this uh, this individual task. Uh, and there's some special cases here, but it's really uh, pretty 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 straightforward. Uh, the point task one is actually a little uh, different. You can see the point task one, uh, this handle feature for point tasks, is actually going to pass back our future to our slice task uh, owner. Uh, and then they're going to be the one to respons be responsible for uh, actually doing the handling of this, this future. Uh, so if I uh, keep going here on handle future, uh, we see that there are cases for, for pretty much all the different kinds of tasks. You can see the slice task one is a little more complicated. Uh, we'll dig into that when we look at index based tasks a little more. So anyway, uh, this handle future method is just passing the future result uh, back uh, in the right way for our various kinds of, of uh, task operations. And then what you do, what you'll see is that we actually offload uh, the remaining set of work for, for finishing up this task uh, onto a utility processor uh, if, we, uh, if we have one. Uh, the reason for this is there's actually a little bit more work that's a little bit heavier weight. Effectively, all this work that we've done so far here is pretty lightweight work uh, to do uh, for when tasks actually uh, finish running. Um, but what we want to do is actually offload some of the potentially heavier work uh, onto a utility processor so we can get, effect, if you recall that this is when we're still here in end task, we're still running on the application uh, uh, processor. So this is a wall of runtime processor that's been dedicated uh, specifically for application level tasks. So while this stuff is all light enough to do directly on that application level processor, uh, some of the remaining work is actually heavy enough that we need to, uh, to actually offload that onto utility processor if we have one. Uh, so if we do have one, we're going to spawn uh, another one of these high-level runtime meta tasks to actually do the what we call the post-end task, the, what we do after we've completed ending our task. Um, and uh, and yeah, this this is basically uh, this is really just a, a high-level runtime meta task, which is going to end up calling this post-end task uh, uh, method. Uh, in the case where we don't have utility processor, we just call this directly. There's no point in in deferring it any longer uh, than we have to. Okay, so let's actually look at post-end uh, task execution here. Um, so you note, note that the first thing that we do uh, once we're done with our execution for this task is we can actually call a complete execution, uh, which is going to mark uh, that this task has finished uh, executing uh, as part of its uh, as part of its stage of the pipeline. This is recall this is a, a method that gets invoked on every uh, operation once it's done with its execution. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually try to figure out what it's necessary to do in order for this task uh, to actually consider itself complete. So you recall that uh, for normal operations, usually a task is complete once it's done uh, once it's done mapping and and executing. Um, the difference with task operations, unlike uh, normal operations, is that there's actually a third criteria for them to actually be considered uh, complete. Uh, to enter the complete stage of, of our operation pipeline. And that is, we need to know that all of our child tasks are also complete. Uh, and you're seeing, again, another one of these recursive definitions where 
a task isn't considered to be complete until all of its children are complete. And therefore all of its children, you know, they also need to have all of their children complete uh, and so forth. Um, and so what we do is we actually have another stage to the, we add another stage to the pipeline uh, for these, uh, for task objects, uh, which is they need to know that their children have com have, have uh, both have completed in order for them to be complete. Uh, and again, we also uh, know that all of our children need to commit before we're allowed to commit. Um, so what we do is we actually track uh, two different uh, two additional stages uh, on on our our task object to know whether or not uh, all of our children have have either completed uh, and or committed. Um, and actually, I can show you uh, where that is on legiontask.h just to show you what the state is. Uh, we actually search for trigger children uh, complete. So you see there are two methods here uh, that are added uh, to our task. This is our task op class. Uh, just to show you, this is the base class for all task operations. And so you notice that they both have these, these two new trigger calls, uh, uh, trigger children uh, complete and trigger children committed. And so you can see that uh, we have a couple of different uh, stages, or we, we have some additional state information here that we track on every task operation. So the first thing we track is whether or not we've received our complete from our base operation. Uh, and normally we would, under most operational cases, we would know that once we got the trigger complete uh, call, we were ready to, to actually go ahead and do our completion. But for tasks, uh, it's not quite so simple. We actually need to know that our children are complete also in order to consider ourselves complete. So effectively, both of these Booleans have to be considered true uh, before we can actually uh, consider ourselves complete. And the same thing with commit. Once we've received a commit call from our base operation or base operation class, uh, we can mark that our commit has been received. Uh, but we can't really consider ourselves committed until we know that all of our child tasks, our child operations that we've launched off have also uh, committed. Um, so uh, yeah, so we've got is uh, we've got these uh, trigger children complete and trigger children committed calls, which actually track uh, when uh, uh, when our child tasks or all our child operations have either completed or committed. Uh, and then what we do is we end up invoking these uh, trigger task complete and trigger task commit methods once we know that uh, we've received our complete and all of our children are considered complete. So effectively, in order to invoke this method, uh, complete has to be uh, true and children complete has to be has to be true. Uh, so I can actually show you where these uh, these calls are just to, to make everything concrete. So I'm jumping back into Legion Tasks uh, .cc. So I search for trigger children uh, complete. This is the method that gets called when we know all of our child operations have been completed. Uh, and so you see is we uh, take our lock, uh, we mark that all our children are complete, and then we check to see if we've already received our complete operation from our, uh, from our base operation class. Uh, if it's true, uh, then we can invoke uh, trigger task complete. Uh, and complementary, uh, if you recall, there's a uh, uh, there's a trigger complete method which gets invoked by the base operation class uh, right here. Trigger complete. So this is getting called by the base operation class uh, once we've you know both mapped and executed. Uh, what we do here is we again take our lock, uh, we mark that our complete is received, and then we're only allowed to trigger that the whole task is complete if we also know that our children complete uh, or all of our children are complete or true as well. Uh, and so if that's true, then we can call this this trigger task complete method. Uh, and you'll the same the, the trigger commit uh, and trigger children commit uh, follows exactly the same pattern. Uh, just you know the next stage of the pipeline for checking to make sure that we're allowed to commit only once we know it's safe for us to commit and we know that all of our our children have committed. Okay, and so then what we do is we end up having this uh, this trigger task complete uh, and trigger task commit methods that get invoked. Uh, which are virtual methods, which can be, which are different for every kind of uh, base task uh, class. Uh, just to show you what one of these uh, trigger task complete methods look like, uh, we can actually look at individual task uh, trigger task complete, and we see that uh, once we know that our task is complete, uh, if we're uh, not remote, uh, we're going to pass back some privileges to our parent task. Uh, we're going to actually complete our future, which is actually going to say this future is ready to be consumed uh, by anyone else. Uh, if we are remote, we're going to do some some logging to send back information that we've actually finished uh, executing that we're complete, uh, and then we're going to do some some cleanup work 
to actually uh, clean clean up uh, some of the the state that we've had uh, as part of our as part of our execution. Uh, and then again, there's also this trigger uh, trigger task commit method, uh, which will get called once uh, we're where we've marked that it's okay for us to commit, and all of our children are are can commit as well. Okay, that was a very long detour uh, from post end tasks. So let's uh, step back to post end task. Uh, so right, uh, so we're doing here uh, just to it all started looking at this block of code, you know, looking to see what has actually occurred. And what we're doing here is we're checking uh, at the end of post end end task. We're doing is we're actually checking to see uh, whether or not uh, we can actually invoke any of those methods uh, right away. Uh, uh, and so we're checking the conditions. Notice we're holding our operation lock. We're checking to see if all of our children have actually completed, uh, and so forth. And then if they are, then we can trigger the right uh, sub sub mappings like trigger children complete or trigger children committed, uh, and so forth. Uh, you also notice here that uh, in some cases, if we had uh, virtual mappings, uh, then we can actually you know call complete mapping uh, at this point. Okay, so this post end task. Uh, and you know, I mentioned that this post end task, we were offloading this onto a utility processor uh, because it can actually generate a significant amount of work. Uh, this function actually looks pretty simple, but recall that you know when we invoke things like complete execution or trigger children complete or trigger children committed, this can actually result in you know propagating uh, additional stages of the pipeline, and we might end up you know running through a whole bunch of stages, the remaining stages of the pipeline for this task operation. Uh, which can be rather expensive, uh, and so just keep in mind that any one of these calls to do one of these, you know, event programming operations uh, can, you know, be uh, can, can actually be be drafted into handle into doing the next stage of the pipeline as well. Uh, and so we might end up, you know, actually doing a significant amount of computation here to to wrap up uh, this post end task. Okay, so uh, we look so. Uh, I guess maybe the next thing to look at uh, is just uh, very briefly uh, to look at, uh, let's see, got about 10 minutes left. So I'm not sure I want to jump into index-based tasks today. So what I think I want to do is actually look at uh, these stages. Uh, we were actually looking up here earlier uh, at these, these tracking of uh, these executing children and executed children. Uh, uh, data structures that we track on every single single task. And what I think I want to do is actually show you how we track all that information uh, when tasks are actually uh, actually running so that we can actually uh, know which children are still outstanding uh, when our tasks are actually finishing. Okay, so let me first jump back here uh, and show you where uh, these, uh, uh, these, these data structures are defined. Okay, so I'm jumping into legion task.h. I'm going to search for class single task. Here's our single task class. Scroll past all the methods it supports. Okay, uh, here's our data structures. Okay. We have three data structures here uh, that are actually tracking uh, the state of all of our various outstanding child operations that we've launched as part of the execution of this, uh, this single task. Uh, so we have a set of children which are still executing. Uh, these are ones that are still in flight, uh, that are that are yet to that are either you know have yet to map or are actually executing at the moment. Uh, we we actually don't need to distinguish between those two. Uh, it's not necessary as long as they're in flight. Uh, then we we don't really care. Uh, we track uh, all of the children uh, which are executed uh, to actually know the ones that are executed but haven't completed yet. Uh, and then finally we have. And an example of this, you know, would be if we launched a bunch of child tasks uh, which have all finished uh, executing, uh, but haven't actually had their children finish, uh, or actually haven't had their children uh, complete yet, and therefore they can't consider themselves complete. Uh, and then finally, we have a list of all of our outstanding operations which have completed but haven't yet uh, haven't yet committed. Uh, so, so these are our three very different data structures uh, that actually uh, track the state of all the different operations. Uh, that are outstanding uh, inside of our inside of our uh, our task operation. Just a brief comment on this data type here. Uh, you notice these are labeled legion sets. Uh, these are just a wrapper around a basic STL set uh, uh, data structure. Uh, but one of the things we do is we have a little bit of infrastructure to actually track uh, memory usage uh, for certain data structures that can tend to be uh, rather large. 
Uh, and so this, you know, executing child alloc is a is a enum uh, that's actually naming an allocation pool of memory, uh, effectively all tracking how many executed children uh, pointers we've stored all over the system, all over our, our node. Uh, and so we have a way of, of instrumenting our memory usage of various internal data structures inside the high-level runtime. Uh, so anytime anywhere you see one of these legion sets, uh, you can just rename uh, that data structure in your mind as as an STL as an STL set, uh, just with a custom allocator that's tracking uh, some allocation of that memory. Uh, and actually, it's actually when we uh, turn off the the allocation tracking, it just defaults back to a normal STL STL set uh, with all the various uh, uh, with all the the base kinds of information. Okay, let me actually show you how these three data structures uh, get updated to actually track all the outstanding operations uh, inside of a subtask or inside of a task that's executing. Okay, so uh, actually, uh, let's actually jump into legiontask.cc. Uh, we'll actually see where these, uh, actually, I've forgotten the names of these methods. Let's jump back to legiontask.h, uh, search executing children. So I believe up here in all these methods on uh, on single tasks, here we go. Uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, calls here uh, that we have on uh, task uh, on single task objects that actually allow us to uh, indicate that certain operations are entering different stages of this pipeline. So register child operation will put it in the executing pool. Register child execute will move it from the executing to the executed pool. Register child complete will move it from the executed pool to the complete pool, and then register child commit will remove it from the complete from the complete uh, pool. Okay, so let's actually look at these methods uh, inside of legiontask.cc. Oh, register child. Uh, if I can spell. Uh, I actually clicked on the wrong file. Sorry about that. That's Legion Trace. Uh, we want Legion Tasks. Okay. Now that we're in the right file, uh, register child uh, operation. Okay. Uh, what you see is uh, we do is we take a little lock here. Uh, we add the operation uh, to the data structure. Uh, and then we do is we actually have a little bit of checking here to actually see if we've launched enough too many child tasks uh, into our context. At which point, you know, we actually say we've run far enough ahead to actually stop executing this uh, this parent task. Uh, I'm not going to get into this today. Uh, it's actually a pretty simple piece of code. Uh, in fact, we actually let the mappers choose how far ahead uh, are we want these windows to be of outstanding operations uh, inside of our inside of our uh, parent uh, inside of this this context. Uh, but really, the base part of this is we take our lock, uh, we add our operation to the data structure, and then we're done. Um, there's some extra stuff down here for tracing, but nothing uh, that we need to get into today. Uh, and then if we scroll down here, uh, here's register child executed. Uh, so again, you see we take the lock, uh, we remove our, our operation from the list of executing children, uh, we add it to the list of executed children, uh, and if necessary, we'll uh, wake up our parent task that we might have blocked uh, if we had too many outstanding uh, operations. Uh, and then we have, again, similar things for, for our uh, register child complete and register child commit. So let me just show you where these, these calls are made from. You're actually going to see they come from a very familiar place. Uh, they actually end up being made inside of legionops.cc. Uh, uh, so if we search for register child operation in here, what you'll see is that uh, this operation class uh, is part of uh, its various stages of the pipeline uh, actually makes these calls for us. Uh, and so this is the benefit of having these, you know, complete execution, complete mapping, and so forth, is that we've actually put the right uh, register calls in the right place uh, for each of these different operations. Uh, so notice, uh, uh, I'll come back to this, uh, this track parent here in just a minute, um, but you'll notice that if we're tracking our parent, uh, we automatically get the register child operation uh, call done when we call initialize operation. Uh, if we look at register, if we search for register uh, child executed, uh, you can see that as soon as we've called complete execution on our operation, one of the first things that we do uh, is we actually tell our parent task uh, that we've uh, registered, that we've actually finished executing. Uh, so again, you, this is where we see our uh, our parent task being notified that we've executed. 
Uh, and same thing happens for register child uh, complete. And so recall that these like complete methods are just the things that you call as soon as you finish different stages for any operation. And so the nice thing is that we've abstracted all these details, so you don't need to remember to do all these calls. Uh, they're all just taking place inside of this, this base operation class. Uh, so if we're tracking our parent, all these things will get done for you. Uh, let me just say a brief word about this uh, track parent uh, call. You'll see that it's actually getting uh, set uh, as part of this initialized operation call that gets done before any operation starts really executing. There's this bool track uh, method uh, that we get, that gets set. Uh, and pretty much the rule for tracking whether or not you want to track is whether or not uh, this operation is local uh, inside of a context or, or not remote. So for pretty much every operation this, that we launch that's not a task, uh, this track will be true uh, because we want to track all of our operations that have been launched inside of our, our parent task uh, uh, context. The one real exception to this is if you have a task, uh, when you first launch it, it will definitely be tracked uh, on the local node. Uh, but when you actually move it to a remote node, uh, then you don't want to track it anymore. Effectively, we don't, we, we don't need to track it uh, once we've moved the task to a remote node, uh, because really the context oper context that we have wrapping it is really just a dummy context uh, that you know has some information about uh, or, or provides necessary methods for actually representing all the state of the context remotely, but it's not actually doing all the stuff like scheduling and stuff that that our context is doing uh, on the original owner node uh, for our task. You can think of this track parent as really being a euphemism for whether or not uh, you're remote. Uh, there are a couple other subtleties uh, to it, but uh, for the most part, uh, if you're on a local node, uh, pretty much every operation is going to be uh, is going to be tracking its parent, uh, so in, informing its parent whenever it moves to the various stages of the pipeline. Uh, but if you're remote, uh, you're not going to be doing uh, doing these various operations. And so, uh, just to wrap up today, uh, you know, just to come back to these uh, three data structures that we're looking at, uh, we search for children complete or trigger, or, or, or I guess it was executing children. So just to wrap up, these three data structures allow any of our uh, single tasks as they're running to actually know all about all of their different sub-operations that are, that are being executed and what stage they're in uh, inside the pipeline. Uh, and this proves to be very important as we saw today for you know, knowing when it's safe to clean ourselves up, uh, when we're safe to consider ourselves mapped, uh, when it's safe to actually uh, consider ourselves complete, uh, and so forth. Um, so every single one of our tasks, regardless of whether they're individual tasks or point tasks, track information about all the different sub-operations uh, as part of their, their execution. Okay, so we didn't get the index-based tasks uh, today. Uh, I will start with those uh, the next time. Uh, but hopefully after today, you actually get a good feel for what it means for a task to actually uh, be executed. Uh, and how our tasks uh, wrap themselves, wrap up our application level tasks with those wrappers, uh, and then uh, how we track operations as part of the execution uh, of, a, of a parent task uh, context. Okay, uh, with that, uh, if no one has any questions, I think we're done for today, uh, and we'll see you guys next Monday.